presentation tonight, and his presentation is Electronically Assisted Astronomy on a Budget, a Cheap and Easy Way to See Further into the Cosmos. So without further ado, Don. Thanks, Jim. Now, of course, if I could see deeper into my computer here, I wanted to establish an internet connection for a couple of video clips, and now I can't uh, find the presentation. All right, there we go. There we go. Um, electronically assisted astronomy on a budget, a cheap asterisk and easy asterisk way to look deeper into the cosmos. Uh, most of you aren't new to astronomy, and uh, those of you who are just getting started probably know nothing's ever that cheap or that easy, but we'll see how far we can push it, uh, both in terms of gear selection and as a, uh, as a club. Uh, this photo is of my first attempt at electronically assisted astronomy, where I snapped a, I, I attached a smartphone uh, to one of my telescopes, my refractor, um, through an eyepiece and on a guided mount was able to take some pictures that I'll share with you later. Uh, the, some of this is based on a prime focus article I wrote back in uh, January, I think, but of last year, but um, with some updates for technology as well. So really quickly, uh, why would we want to do electronically assisted astronomy? What are some approaches? How does it compare with astrophotography? And some concluding thoughts on all this work to do images versus expanding our imaginations. Uh, why electronically assisted astronomy? I gave a talk last year, uh, back in May, where I was speaking about building a mental map of the cosmos. Essentially what we wanted to do is go beyond this two-dimensional bubble that surrounds us, one that kind of lies to us and makes it look like the sun revolves around the earth and so does the moon and we've got these planets that are zigzagging. It took us millennia to figure out how that two-dimensional sphere related to our three-dimensional cosmos. And as a part of that, I had this challenge to myself of really trying to communicate the depth of astronomy and its beauty to those who may look up at the stars just as the sphere and really appreciate the beauty but may not have much understanding of where they fit inside that big puzzle. Um, so um, really where this story began for me, and I, I may have mentioned this last time, is uh, w my wife and I were camping at Hocking Hills. We went over to the John Glenn Astronomy Park, and uh, for my very first time, I put M31 Andromeda in my six-inch uh, telescope, a Mac cast, and that's about what I saw, right? I invited my wife over. She put her eye to the eyepiece and said, huh, is that what you were expecting? Um, <laughs> Needless to say, you know, I, I've, I, I'm in, enough into sci-fi that I was able to fill in some of the gaps about just how spectacular an image this was. It, but uh, my wife does not like Star Trek. She doesn't even like Star Wars, which is barely sci-fi. Um, perhaps a controversial point, but I'll fight you for it. Um, and, um, you know, really this began my journey into telescope-based astronomy. Uh, so this is my wife and uh, my dear friend Vicky. I call her the older sister I never wanted. We were out at uh, Death Valley, as Jim said, said gallivanting uh, in December, which is why I missed our big party. And part of my reason for wanting to go there was because it's one of the darkest sky locations in the United States. I discovered it's not quite as dark as Big Bend uh, down in Texas. Uh, you can see a little bit of a light dome from Vegas on the, uh, on the eastern, uh, over the eastern ridges, but it's pretty darn dark. Uh, I think it's Bortal 2 is, is where it comes in. So um, the uh, family unit hauls out to Death Valley, and based on the talk that I gave back in May, I had this whole plan in my head. I wanted to show them the moon, the planets, our solar neighborhood, the Orion Nebula, which is sort of in our galactic neighborhood, moving out to a, a globular cluster just outside the galaxy, and then finally uh, concluding with the next galaxy over, or at least the next major one. Um, to aid me in this process, uh, last month's prime focus I was delighted to see when I got it about four days before we left for California, was a write-up of the, of the moons of Jupiter, 
uh, by our own Tom Burns that, uh, among other things, informed us that uh, the moons were among the first things Galileo saw, which is why we call them the Galilean moons, and they helped prove that another planet besides Earth had things swirling around it, which maybe introduced a modicum of doubt to this idea that the entire universe was just centered around the Earth, right? Uh, the Earth was uh, the center of the universe. So um, armed with uh, this great little nugget, as well as uh, in the very same article, it was almost like Prime Focus was written for me, uh, Brad had done this beautiful write-up of our galactic neighborhood, the local cluster, right? And I, I had to email him to try to get straight in my head how he pulled this off. He took a three-dimensional map of our galactic neighborhood and juxtaposed that with a, uh, a two-dimensional uh, celestial sphere map of our constellations so that you could see where in the constellations you can find those objects. Uh, just really uh, in the spirit of what I was striving to do, but with much less uh, sort of clarity and resolution in terms of, of visualizing our neighborhood. So I, I brought that with me to, uh, to show my, uh, my, my clients, my students, my astronomical targets. I should say about these two, it's not that they lack awe for the universe, but they really, when they look up at the stars, they just see sparkling, shimmering diamonds, and their imaginations don't really go much beyond that. They're both very much creatures of the Earth and its, and its, and its creatures. So these are the, probably two of the toughest targets for outreach you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I failed miserably, so I'm going to have to bring them to a CAS outreach function and see how the pros do it. Um, so yeah, we, again, we can kind of zoom in here and talk about the local group that uh, Brad describes to us. Um, also, his article really made me want to go to the Southern Hemisphere and check out the uh, Magellanic Clouds. Magellanic Clouds. Okay, yeah. Oh, man, chomping at the bit. So in designing a syllabus for the stars, uh, we've got some challenges. Number one, in different times of year, different objects are more or less prominent. Uh, just depending on where the constellations that they're located in the sky, whether they're closer to the zenith where we get less atmosphere, or if they're even above the horizon at all. We have moon cycles, which if you're trying to uh, see the moon uh, during a new moon, that's not going to work for you. If you're trying to see uh, deep sky objects during a full moon, that's probably not going to work well for you either, unless you've got a majority billion inch uh, telescope. And then we also have the cycle of the planets. When they're above the horizon, they can actually come a little bit closer or further from us as well. They turn, so if you want to see the red dot on Jupiter, you better time it right. Um, and again, this, this perennial problem, as I see it, of uh, we, we live in a three-dimensional universe, but it, it's smeared across a two-dimensional plane uh, surrounding us, right? Um, so I decided, uh, with timing of the trip, or it just kind of worked out this way, um, that we were going to be there for the new moon, which I thought was a great opportunity uh, to see the DSOs of uh, the deep sky objects. Um, Jupiter was up, so here we are. I was going to be able to use Tom Burns' uh, article to uh, show some Jupiter trivia, uh, as well as Orion. You've got to wait a little bit later in the night for that one to get high in the sky, but uh, we've got access to uh, a nebula. Um, and then, uh, which is in our, again, our corner of the galaxy, on the same spur of the spiral arm uh, where our solar system's located. Then you've got the double cluster, the next arm over in Perseus. So we're still sort of still staying within the galaxy. Um, and then finally going out to Andromeda and its friends uh, in gravitational relationship to each other beyond our galaxy, but part of the, our local group. The results of this? Um, more of that. <laughs> <laughs> now, a couple of issues here. Number one, it's not the smallest telescope in the world, but it's the biggest one that I can uh, convince my wife to haul with us on camping trips because it fits underneath the bed of our trailer. So it's a six-inch Mac CAS, uh, which, again, has formidable capability for planets and, and some deep sky objects, particularly in dark sky locations, but it's not a 12-incher. It's certainly not a 24-incher, right? Uh, other pr uh, challenges that were introduced, uh, the winds kicked up, so uh, my clients were shivering. Um, 
I had the night before performed my two-star alignment and parked the scope, so we were just going to be ready to go as soon as our eyes got adjusted to, uh, to the darkness, had everybody fitted with the, uh, the uh, red headlamps, um, which was a really good idea because we were constantly, but my, unfortunately, as I was going through the menu, my, uh, my mount de-aligned or I hit the wrong button and it lost it, so I had to perform another two-star alignment while they were shivering. Um, once I got it aligned and was getting a target in and focused, uh, I had to jump out of the chair so that they could jump in the chair, uh, which was made all the worse by rocks surrounding the viewing area. If you uh, uh, go to J Gap or just out here in the grass and, and appreciate the fact that there's no rocks or fail to appreciate it, let me tell you, clearing out the space around your observatory is, is really important. I had one of those I've fallen and I can't get up moments when my chair tipped over. Uh, from me trying to get up in the rocks. So, again, uh, some, uh, some missed opportunities there. Uh, but I think the, um, the biggest uh, difficulty that I had was really in verbalizing some of the dimensions of the universe. And once we put those, uh, what I, my attempts to verbalize into the scope, the results were less than, than the Hubble Space Telescope, shall we say. Um, so my natural technical uh, approach to solving this problem would be to turn to new gadgets, and that's electronically assisted astronomy. I'm going to talk at the end here about where I think some of these limitations to a gadget-based approach are just more aperture is better. Uh, this is essentially what I'm going to walk us through. Uh, uh, thanks to another member of our uh, club, uh, Marshall, in this most recent uh, issue of Prime Focus, I, I was introduced to night vision devices, which I don't know anything about, but I, based on his article, was able to do a little bit of research. I'll preview um, what I think I saw there, and then we can talk about that in Q&A. Um, electronically assisted telescopes, um, fairly new to the scene, I think maybe, what, about five, six years old. Uh, they're sometimes called smart telescopes. Uh, both of these are very expensive. You're talking thousands of dollars just to get started. Uh, the night division devices, you still got to attach them to a normal telescope and mount, so I, I think medium complexity we would call it for high cost. These new electronically assisted or smart telescopes, uh, very low complexity, very plug and play. So simple even a social scientist could use one, I think. But uh, again, almost prohibitively expensive for some. Next, we have uh, AstroCam, electronically assisted astronomy, some of the same cameras that you might use to do astrophotography. Uh, that can range from low to mortgage your house high in cost. Uh, again, we're starting medium complexity, and, and I'm afraid to join CASIS because of the high complexity I see as you go further in, in chasing the, uh, the Jim Webb Space Telescope grade uh, results. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll talk about the one that I've spent the most time with that I selected because it was both low cost and low complexity, uh, thanks to a viewing session we had out here during uh, two lunar eclipses ago with uh, Don Stevens. So again, um, uh, thank you, Marshall, for your article on uh, night vision astronomy. I learned a lot from it, and I was drooling at some of the results. And Marshall, I understood you took these with a, a smartphone just attached to the, uh, to the device. Uh, just really stunning results. So it's sort of a hybrid of, of the one I focused on, which is afocal. You just basically bolt your, uh, not bolt, but attach through some device your smartphone to an eyepiece to the telescope. Uh, in this instance, the night vision uh, device becomes uh, part of the eyepiece, I gather and then you can attach a smartphone to that. Just really remarkable results. If you haven't read this uh, piece yet, I highly recommend you check it out um, and get ready to uh, sell off some of your Astro gear to fund the purchase, as Marshall said, or, uh, or get that second mortgage on your house. Uh, this is the device itself. They've got it set up to, uh, with a, um, you know, just a small, I think, 50, 60 millimeter telescope there. On, the, um, on one of the websites that previews the, uh, the Teleview version of the uh, night vision device, uh, they had a cool little video here. Now, this video was not produced with this scope. It was a 32-inch Dobsonian, which I confess I didn't, even know, I didn't know they even made them that big. But uh, we can get some sense of um, what these things are capable of here, assuming my uh, internet cooperates. There we go. 
So just a really stunning, fairly, oh, even closer up view of uh, M42 there. I mean, to me, this is absolutely um, what I was imagining when I first went to JGAP and pointed my, uh, my telescope up into the sky. So I think um, hopefully more people buy these things and their cost comes down or, um, you know, maybe uh, eventually the club could pick up one for our uh, gear library that Jim was mentioning. But just a really, uh, you know, ephemeral sort of take on uh, the star nursery uh, next door to us here. So moving on from there to electronically assisted telescopes, sort of, I, I, in college I was a computer salesman, so you always start from high cost and then bring it down to low cost, so your customers think they're getting a bargain by the end. So let's start with the $45,000 one here. This bad boy, they'll bolt it onto your front porch if you want. Um, it's, uh, and then what it allows you to do as a, as a smart scope, it's got the, uh, the uh, CMOS camera built into it, and it uh, will beam whatever it's imaging straight to an iPad or a laptop or even your smartphone, and you can watch it as it's uh, basically, uh, I'm going to use terms that most of you know, but for those of you who don't know, sort of stacking multiple exposures and gathering more and more light to produce a more refined image. Uh, it's essentially doing all that automatically with its uh, computer circuit wizardry and then projecting that to the device of your choice where you can uh, take snapshots of it, record it, share it to Instagram, whatever you want to do. This particular one, uh, and here's uh, one of the images uh, produced uh, with this scope. Uh, it's a 150 millimeter apochromatic refractor. So just a, a honking, beautiful piece of optics uh, with a thousand millimeter focal length, which works out to be about f7, so pretty good light gathering capability. Uh, talking to a full frame uh, Sony sensor uh, that's actually upgradable given the cost you'd hope it was so that as sensor technology improves in the future. This one's not too shabby. It's cranking out 61 megapixels at a uh, pixel size of 3.76. I don't even know what that unit is. Microns. Um, in some future talk, uh, Isaac or uh, someone will explain to us uh, why pixel size is really important and matters. But uh, as I understand, it's, it's, a, it's a factor we want to take into consideration. And you're not going to be hauling this thing up the mountain because it weighs 165 pounds. So again, it literally has to be bolted, uh, bolted down. Um, moving rapidly down in price to the fire sale price of $2,500 <laughs> is this little guy. Uh, same company, Vaunus. Uh, uh, both the companies that make these smart telescopes are based in France, if I understand correctly. Um, much more portable. Um, you can't really get a sense of the difference in image quality between the two. Uh, but please explain to my wife why I need the $45,000 one, because this is a much more inferior image. It's so pixelated. Uh, you just couldn't really, I mean, it's, it's okay. But um, we're going down from a 150 millimeter aperture to a 50 millimeter aperture, still apochromatic, which means it's going to handle bright lights and color fringing very well. Bright stars aren't going to get all purpley like the photos I'm about to show you from my non-apochromatic refractor. Um, but uh, focal length of uh, 200 millimeters, so a fairly short focal length, so fairly low magnification with an F4 uh, focal length there, so really good light gathering capability. Uh, the Sony sensor uh, that punches out two megapixels. So again, this resolution is fine for presentations on screen, for sharing on Instagram, but you're not going to blow it up and put it on your wall, right? But it comes in at 11 pounds. So you can put it in a backpack, take it to a dark sky location, and kind of offset some of what you're losing in, uh, in aperture there, to some degree, to some degree. Uh, different company, Unistellar, their high-end one is called the EV Scope 2. Um, basically, what distinguishes it from its, uh, its sibling is that Nikon built them an eyepiece that's also digital. Uh, it's uh, essentially an OLED, like some of the fancy televisions you have now that deliver perfect blacks and, and pretty good brights and good color. Um, so it gives you the simulation of a true optical telescope experience, 
Uh, but it's really just a different way of seeing what you can see with all the other ones, which is if you were to beam it to an iPhone or a, uh, or a tablet. Uh, this is an image it produced of, uh, of M42, the Orion Nebula, in a 21-minute uh, exposure, so 20 minutes of light gathering and stacking. Uh, this is a shot of the moon, which of course being so bright didn't require uh, much in the way of exposure at all, I think 0 0.08 milliseconds. Um, again, an icon eyepiece, um, and there's a link here, we'll see if we can make that work so you can kind of see how it stacks into the eyepiece there. Hopefully that works. Hopefully I can get back to this. I saw a little warning thing saying, are you sure you want to open this? And then... I'm not hoping to tell you why she's still going to say, uh-huh, I see. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's probably true. It's probably true. I think so, man. I think so. She's worth it. Um, yeah, that's not really cooperating, so we'll, uh, we'll skip it. But um, if you go to Unicellar's website and check out the EV Scope 2 uh, and scroll down, once you're done drooling, you can click on the uh, little eyepiece video there. Um, 114 millimeter reflector. Right, uh, so some different properties than the refractor. Um, 450 millimeter focal length, uh, really good uh, light gathering at f3.9, 50 times magnification, so a little bit more capable at imaging planets uh, than the low end version of the uh, Vionis. Um, a Sony sensor that'll give you 7.7 .7 megapix megapixels and a 20 pound weight, including tripod, so it's portable capable of going to dark sky locations, and you could start printing uh, photos with 7.7 uh, with megapixels. You'd have uh, decent uh, pixel density there. The low in, lower end version of this, uh, the Equinox 2, as far as I can tell, it's virtually identical in terms of basic attributes. It just doesn't have that Nikon eyepiece. Um, slightly lower pixels, although it's the same, uh, megapixels, although it's the same sensor. So for $2,500, Again, uh, really remarkable images of, um, of the Andromeda galaxy, Jupiter and its moons. Um, like I said, really just uh, shaving a few megapixels off and um, deleting the, uh, the pseudo eyepiece uh, from Nikon there. So now going into AstroCam, electron electronically assisted astronomy. Uh, this is something I've never experienced. I was going to borrow... Um, the AstroCam that the club recently bought in anticipation of this talk, but the, as you've seen the weather in the last week, tonight would have been, I think, the first night where I could have done it. So um, this is sort of, this is going to leave more questions than answers. But essentially, uh, the club now owns a ZWO ASI 120 MCS. It's technically a planetary uh, uh, AstroCam, but it is capable of accumulate uh, long, long enough exposures that if you stack them, you can get some pretty remarkable deep sky results, as I'll show you in a minute. The trick with these is, it's not one of those magic things where it outputs via Bluetooth or even via cable straight to an iPad, straight to an iPhone. You have to run it through a computer. The typical way to do it is through a laptop, but uh, there are some alternatives to that. There's a thing called a Raspberry Pi that's uh, sort of a figured out as you go microcomputer that can uh, be loaded with uh, computer uh, or astronomy pro image processing software, or you can buy it all in one package in terms of the ASI Air, which has had a few different iterations. This one is really stinking cool because not only will it output to an iPad directly, so you don't need a laptop or anything like that, it has controls on the iPad screen so that you can manipulate the, uh, the exposure settings, adjust brightness, contrast, and see the image emerging live right before your very eyes. Um, and again, 
Very exciting. I'm still rating this as uh, medium to high in terms of, of complexity because you've got to master the ASI software and get it uh, powered and linked up. And you know, you, I don't know if you saw from that first image here, just a lot of cabling going on associated with, you know, you've got a guide scope, so your, uh, so your camera is always pointed at the object it's, it's intended to and tracking it. It's a lot. It's a whole lot. Right, but really, um, this type of approach can give you, of all the options we've seen, probably the most superior uh, quality of images. These allegedly, and this is coming from the manufacturer, were all images taken with the, and this one goes for normally about three hundred dollars. But because our club owns one and it's going in our uh, gear uh, loan program, uh, you'll be able to check this out at, at no cost to you. Right, once we get that program up and running. Um, allegedly, these were images that were captured uh, with this device. Now, this is probably less in the range of electronically assisted astronomy and more in the range of, uh, of images that were, you know, the way they do it for planets, as I understand it, is you take hundreds, if not thousands, of photos and select the ones that, where the atmosphere was just right, so they were sharp, and you put those together. Um, I know nothing about uh, solar observation, but it looks like it could be a great companion to our, our new solar scope. Uh, the moon, a little bit less prohibitive, again, similar to planets, just uh, going for those lucky shots where uh, the atmosphere wasn't uh, warbling and, and smashing them together. And then um, it didn't have any data on how long the exposure was or how many stacks were required to produce this, uh, this image of of a deep sky object, but again, I think it's indicative of what we might be able to squeeze out of uh, this device, even for outreach or, or just uh, observing electronically assisted astronomy. John, yeah. Please. Yeah. To your laptop. To your laptop, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I understand that ASI does have an app where it will show you a live view on, on at least some of their models directly to an iPad, but it, it can't do any live stacking. Um, so it can do live stacking, but then you're going to have to run it through a laptop or run it through an ASI Air. There is apparently one way to do it where it will show you the live image, but not sort of live stacking it uh, before your very eyes, which is what you see happening here, uh, again from my intro slide, um, which was uh, out in front of this observatory uh, back in, I believe, January. So uh, a little bit about that. So. Smartphone electronically assisted astronomy, you can do it with iPhone or you can do it with Android. I'm a diehard Apple aficionado. I love, I've got their laptop, I've got their iPad, I've got their iPhone, they pretty much own me. Um, the software that runs on the iPhone is limited uh, by Apple uh, to only do up to 10 second exposures. And uh, with the software that comes with the iPhone, nor with uh, an aftermarket one like Nightcap, will it allow you to do live stacking. Whereas with the, um, with the Google Pixel phone, uh, or any Android that gets the uh, free-ish, depending on how you want to uh, define shareware and freeware, um, Google Cam Mod, you can take single exposures up to 16 seconds each and you can do up to 15 of those exposures per image, and it will live stack at the camera. So, and the first time I was exposed to this was when I was out in front of the um, observatory with Don Stevens back in November of last, last year, 2021. Um, and between uh, lunar eclipse shots, he was, um, he was taking uh, live stack photos of, uh, of M42 Orion. And it just blew my mind. He had his Google Pixel phone up against his, uh, his telescope. And we were just watching there, wa seeing the gases of the nebula come to life. And it just absolutely blew my mind. I thought, OK, this is something that I could do 
that would be relatively low cost, relatively simple, and wouldn't distract from the overall observation experience. So thanks, Don. You cost me 150, 200 bucks, but because um, I yeah. In normal astrophotography, we do stacking, right? But it's not combining them, adding them up. It's really doing statistical averaging, which right. is that thing we're really liking. When you're talking about live stacking, it's actually adding the data on top directly without averaging. As I understand it, and Isaac may have to uh, bail me out here, there's actually there's an averaging process and a stacking process normally. What um, what Nightcap is allowed to do with, um, with, uh, with the Apple hardware is only the averaging, which I think is basically used to address the noise issue, right? But then there is the stacking to uh, achieve a functionally higher level of, of resolution. To get a, a brighter and, and, and more highly resolved image. So uh, I appreciate the question, and I meant to, uh, to highlight that here. So what you're getting with uh, live stacking, I presume it's averaging as well. And there's some kind of correction. I don't think it's as, as, as well as they do in the, uh, the proper, like the ASI Air Pro. But there's some extent to which it's correcting the field so that if there's a slight error in the mount in terms of between each of the exposures, how much drift there is, particularly with an alt-as mount that's not following the arc. Um, that it is able to do that to a limited degree. And I'll, I'll show you some results I have. Um, well, the first one here, this was taken by Don Stevens uh, using his Google Pixel phone uh, during the 20, 2021 lunar eclipse. And you can't really tell from the projection here, but trust me that this is a much better image than the one that was produced using the iPhone nightcap program that was much more severely limited in terms of the length of the exposure and it wasn't able to stack, right? So this is, I, I didn't have uh, Don's EXIF data, but it, potentially up to four minutes of data uh, that could be accumulated in, in 16 second uh, individual exposures. A minute and 50. And um, the other thing, it does, it will do some basic processing automatically. Mm -hmm. For dark fields, or it eliminates the dark noise right. damage automatically. And it does some other automatic adjustments. It doesn't do um, flat fields. And that's the only weakness of this, is it does a flat field. So mm -hmm. you would have to basically use the same setup So a dark field is where it just does a dark subtraction to eliminate any noise that's just on the sensor. Uh, explain for the uninitiated, what's a flat field? So it sort of normalizes across the different parts of the, uh, the image. Um, that's remarkable. That's remarkable. Yeah, please. You're still using the tracking map, though, electronic tracking. That's right. I believe Don's and mine. I'm going to show you some of my photos in a minute. Don, I believe, was yours also Altaz, or was yours equatorial? Uh, mine was equatorial. Yours was, was equatorial. Tracking. What's that? I had a tracking scale. Right, right. So that might ex Partially explain. I think you also did a good job with post-processing, but uh, that might explain why your images came out a little bit better than mine, as, as you'll see in a second. I fiddled with the, in the app, the photo app, I fiddled with it a little bit. Same. Cleaned up that way as well. Yeah. Uh, but yes, tracking is essential uh, for this. You know, you can take pictures of the moon without any kind of tracking, again, because it's such a bright object. Uh, the planets, to some degree, although again, um, the best way to take sharp shots of the planets is to take a bunch of them and let a piece of software, I think Registax is, is, is the one they use, uh, to basically 
throw out the ones where the atmosphere was, uh, was warbling and uh, leave you with the crisp ones. Um, but the, but uh, for any kind of deep sky application where you're tracking for multiple seconds, obviously the sky is moving, so you're going to need a tracking mount of some kind. I'm going to show you how humble of a tracking mount you can get by with here in a second. But needless to say, I saw Don doing this and I, my hair was on fire. I ran home, I, I got on cloudy nights, and I wanted to find, which is an online forum for uh, astronomy nerds like us, for those of you who don't know, and, and I wanted to know if anybody had tried this before, uh, electronically assisted astronomy using a Google Pixel phone. And I couldn't find much, so I posted a, a topic where I was just sort of ranting about how amazing Don Stevens' results were, and had anybody tried this? And I got a gentleman uh, link here to, uh, to his posting. Um, you can see the name of my thread, EAA with Google Pixel Phone Night Sight, wow. Um, and he posted up a couple of results that he had uh, doing deep sky objects. This is M3 and M101 here. Uh, he gave the caveat that sometimes the, uh, the Google software gets tricked by the deep sky object. It's, it's, it's with less bright objects. Uh, Orion Nebula, easy, Andromeda, pretty reliable. I'll show you my results with those here in a second. Uh, but he was saying for other slightly more challenging Messier objects, um, it can be a little hit and miss. But again, I just thought these were really remarkable and really inspiring. So I raced to Facebook Marketplace, tried to, uh, to find a uh, Google Pixel 4a, and this was, what, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, I found one for 150 bucks with a slight crack on the screen, which I, I didn't intend to use it for a phone anyway. I was just going to use it for uh, electronically assisted and astrophotography. So I snapped it up, never even activated it, so it's just a dead phone, but I uh, updated over Wi-Fi, load the, uh, the modded app, and um, here's my results. This was my, and this is just totally unedited, this is watching it come alive on the phone, this is what I ended up with, which is 15 11 second exposures for a total of 2.75 minutes total exposure time, uh, strapped to my uh, non-apochromatic refractor, so that's why you see that blooming around really bright stars in the vicinity of M42, because it's, it's you know, we're getting that chromatic aberration that non-apochromatic refractors are known for. It was also a $350, $400 refractor rather than, I'm guessing it would be a three or $4,000 refractor if it was 120 millimeters uh, of apochromatic glass. Um, strapped to a 14 millimeter eyepiece using a uh, Celestron XYZ adapter. They may, there's a lot of different ways you can attach your smartphone to an eyepiece. The Celestron one seems to, I should have put a picture of it up here, but it gives you really precise gearing to move it up and down so that you can get it centered right over, get to your, the camera lens on your smartphone centered right over that eyepiece um, to produce a pretty good result. Um, needless to say, I was thrilled. This is about $1,000 worth of gear all in versus what Unistellar produced. And bear in mind, this is a 21 minute uh, exposure of data that it did. Now, it's also doing some computer processing in the background to clean up that image. This is just what the Google camera app did on its own. Now I'll show you, this was it, uh, sort of with increased exposure, a little bit of saturation, dialing up the contrast so that my blacks are black and my whites are white. The photographer in me isn't crazy uh, by how this came out. I blew out the highlights, including the, uh, the, the, the four stars in the middle there that we, uh, we, we focus on so much. Um, but overall, I think it's a really remarkable re uh, first attempt out of a um, $150 smartphone uh, attached to a $300 refractor, right? Uh, compared to a $2,500 job here. Now I should say that $300 refractor is on an Altaz mount, something similar to this in, in so far as it only rotates in the x-axis and the y-axis. It's not set up like an equatorial mount where you're actually following, uh, following the curvature of, of the stars as they move across the sky. So there's a little bit of that etch-and-sketch, etch-a-sketch sort of moving of it. 
But again, uh, and you can see that a little bit in the stars here where they get a little oblong. That's sort of failures in tracking that the uh, Google camera software wasn't able to correct. But for cheap and easy, um, I think it was a pretty neat result. Now, staying with this theme for a second, I want to talk about uh, the differences, if any, between electronically assisted uh, astronomy versus astrophotography. With these results, I went racing back to that thread that I'd created on cloudy nights and posted uh, my cleaned up results of um, you know, this image, lightly processed in Lightroom, and got chewed out by the moderator, who said, gosh darn it, Don, that is not electronically assisted astronomy. Anything that you did to that image post-processing uh, does not count as EAA. That's astrophotography. And I said to him, I said, well, wait a minute, if I had an ASI Air Pro or a laptop that I was tweaking those exposure and contrast and things like at the scope, would that still be EAA? He said, yes. But the fact that you took it out of the scope and out of that sort of image chain and onto another device, manipulated it, um, you've got to take those images down. That's not EAA. So I took them down and I reposted the originals. Uh, so again, this was what came out of the, uh, the camera, so to speak, out of the smartphone. This is, and I wish I had an animation of it. Don, have you ever taken a, uh, like a video of as it comes to life? No, not that, not like the deep sky on it. I've done like the moon before. You've done the moon on it? It would be so cool. Okay, I mean, just literally see, it, you know, as, as, it's, as it starts uh, accumulating exposures, and the image comes to life on your screen. For those of you who haven't seen it before, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and in a really dark room, or more importantly, out in that dark patch of grass right there, uh, with a backlit screen, it was just absolutely riveting. And then this was the same image after I'd processed it, right? Which even in sort of the questionable lighting of the projector, I think is a pretty exciting image, again, uh, for its results. This is the one I got in trouble with posting on the EAA forum, though. This is the one I was allowed to post. Uh, similar results for um, Andromeda. Again, my wife would probably go, eh, at, uh, at this one. Uh, although, again, in, in better lighting conditions, the dust lane is already really visible along the disk of, uh, of the galaxy as well as its companion galaxy over here. So this was uh, very similar, 15, 12 second exposures for a total of uh, three minutes exposure time. And it cleaned up really, really, really well. I use this one as the background of my laptop. It's not the best picture of Andromeda I, I've ever seen, but gosh darn it, I took it myself. I was there as the photons were collecting and... and it's your picture. It's my picture. There are many like it, but this one is mine. <laughs> Um, you know, and I caught enough of the astrophotography bug that I realized I didn't want to go anywhere near Isaac and Casus because I, I knew that I, I would be divorced by <laughs> the end of the year, probably. It can be done? All right, all right. Maybe with, uh, with some of the equipment coming into the uh, library here, the gear library. But um, again, I think just some, just some really cool results. Um, some things that I learned from my engagement with the moderator at Cloudy Nights. For an electronically assisted image to be considered EAA, all processing must be done in the equipment, at the scope, at the time of capture. Uh, with a bolt-on unit like the ASI Air or a Raspberry Pi microcomputer, you can make those improvements at the scope. And I think for uh, outreach, it probably makes sense. You know, If you had a choice of which one to show folks, um, this one would be more impactful than this one. Um, so if I were to go down that road, I definitely would want to pick up an ASI Air and get it to my iPad, maybe control it from the warmth of my own living room rather than being out in 20 degrees. That's another capability of the ASI Air is the ability to control your telescope remotely. You know, this sounds like, the, it sounds like the standard slippery slope that you're starting. <laughs> I'll tell you <laughs> what, <laughs> you understand it, you understand it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, now let me contradict everything I've just said and, and, and uh, dial out all that excitement and talk about how we approach this hobby and uh, the focusing on images versus, versus focusing on imagination. I had the opportunity um, 
when I was in uh, grad school, I went to a conference in Los Angeles, and a friend of mine, and uh, his good advice, sent me to the Griffith Observatory, where they did a, uh, a show in the planetarium, which I thought was just going to be one of those put in the laser disc and press play, IMAX kind of a thing. This was actually, it's in the Hollywood Hills, literally. Uh, it was voice narrated by a live um, uh, voice actress, and she was describing to us uh, the basically the path of human knowledge of astronomy, how it's progressed uh, from the Stone Age, where we can see it in, in rock paintings on, on, in caves, through the early, uh, uh, you know, out of the prehistoric period and into early human civilization, and the ways that we looked up at the cosmos, tried to make sense of it, and told ourselves stories of it. And rather than take sort of a condescending look at those who told stories before us, uh, they reminded us of just how much we don't fully understand today about the nature of our universe. What is the relationship uh, between uh, gravity and dark matter and the overall size of the universe uh, or the cosmic weight of the universe? It was just a, a, a stunning presentation. And for me, it really drove home this first point, the centrality of stories and storytelling for our comprehension of the stars, right? It's baked into our DNA as, as human beings. Uh, to reach for the story and to weave a narrative together. And I've been fortunate enough to be out on the lawn at JGAP um, when Brad was out there uh, weaving his story with his green sky pen and just eavesdropping from a corner while I was fiddling with my scope. Um, just really blown away by how much uh, the night sky can be transformed by somebody who's well-versed at storytelling. Uh, what this tells me is that while I've, I've gone fairly far down the road of, of the tech, I'm really just at the beginning of my journey as an astronomer, and I need to spend more time out in the grass during outreach events uh, with those of you in this room who have a lot more experience pulling this story together so that, and, and bringing my wife along so that um, when she sees that faint, ever so smudgy image of, of Andromeda through my eyepiece, she'll be able to fill in the gaps. Her imagination, I think, will be able to fill in the gaps and feel some of the awe that I feel when I see it. Um, secondly, and again, I, uh, no knock to uh, cast this at all. I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I'm basically uh, inviting myself to your next meeting. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I do still believe, as much of a Radio Shack gadget freak as I am, there is something absolutely magical about the idea that a photon that's traveled billions of miles over millions of years uh, to reach my eyelid. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an experience, particularly in a dark sky location on a good night when the atmospherics... I experienced this once out in the AEP lands near uh, where we used to have and may soon again have a, uh, a club observatory in a dark sky location. It was just the perfect alignment of... of of atmospherics and, and, and timing for me to uh, see a view of Andromeda that I can't even express to you and I didn't have the skill to photograph. But with my very same equipment, with the very same eyepiece at a different location under different atmospheric conditions, it clicked and in that moment I was just blown away. And then like five minutes later a Bang, a bank of cloud dew just sunk over me. <laughs> my entire imaging session, or my entire viewing session was over. But in that five minutes, um, I truly felt the magic of, of having the photons go straight from the source, off the mirror, and into my eye. So while I think we can use electronically assisted astronomy to turn up the volume a little bit uh, in terms of the majesty of especially some of the harder to see deep sky objects that I haven't even attempted to uh, image yet with my smartphone. I do think um, there's something to even just a pair of binoculars out in the field and seeing that faint smudge and, and using our imagination uh, to fill in the gaps. But with that being said, as, as usual with my talks, the, uh, the Q&A is usually more informative than, um, than my sort of musings. So let me stop there and, and we can uh, have a conversation hopefully. Any uh, questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. I'm 
convinced that you're trying to get this to uh, to wow your wife so that she'll say, yeah, go ahead and buy this. Is that, is that what it is? <laughs> Absolutely. As soon as, as soon as I can get that hot damn, then... Uh, <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yep, yep. So I'm going to bring around... Go ahead and talk to Isaac. So I'm going to bring around Shore Marshall's night vision, device, night vision goggles. Oh, and uh, <laughs> If that gets the hot damn, then we're, we're, in, big, we're in business. <laughs> Have you looked at it yet? Have you looked no. At Just in through prime focus. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good stuff. But the objective is primarily that you could be at a new function and show them the finished product right there with that couple of minutes, right? That's, that's yeah, it's... it's it's, it's outreach for a couple of minutes. You know, I think it's also um, just this idea that um, we can see a little bit deeper watching the image form through that live stacking so that they get a sense that this it wasn't just a copy paste from Google, that they were present as an image was being made in, in, that, in that precious moment. And really, you know, I think what we're talking about, and you know, Brad has invited me to uh, come down sometime when he's down there and look through one of the really big dog telescopes they have at JGAP, um, which will really spoil me on my six inch, I, I fear. Um, but, you know, really just this possibility, either with night, uh, night vision devices or with electronically assisted through an AstroCam or a smartphone, taking a three to six inch telescope and turning it into an observatory extraordinaire, right? Really magnifying the amount of light gathering capability that a smaller aperture telescope can produce. And doing that, again, in a live situation rather than just simply as a photograph that will take hours and days to, to sort of crunch. Just real quick, just around some, whoever parked down the end of the road down there kind of figure out where the lights are on. My, actually, my car is running. It's a diesel, and I ran out of the AdBlue stuff that you're supposed to do it, so it's telling me I won't be able to restart my car until I get some AdBlue. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> what uh, Tom here mentioned about the uh, uh, showing like that uh, uh, outreach programs and that. Yeah. If you're using the camera, any image that you're seeing coming from that telescope mm -hmm. is a better image that we were going to see through that. That's right. I mean, it's just true. In other words, uh, a galaxy will look more like a galaxy which you're used to seeing in a yeah. picture. You get all the dust lanes, yeah. some of the spiral structure. Okay. Anything that, that will integrate more than half a second, which is basically what we've been making our, you know, eyeball mark one, is just basically, you know, better than very much you're having there. But, yeah. but, but oh, that's not what people think they're almost saying here is actually very true. There's a huge difference when you actually see uh, an image that, that it actually is being, is being painted in front of you. Uh, you know, it, that, that's really, that is really a very exciting uh, thing to see, especially for outreach. I think that's very powerful. Yeah, seeing it coming to life. Yeah. But uh, they what? You know, in March, if you come over to my lecture, I mean, I mean, invite your wife to come over, we'll, we'll teach you about, you know, actually taking astrophotography and and the difference between those two. So, All right. That's a good plug for that. And um, I think in our last officers meeting, we successfully recruited Brad to uh, come talk to us in April about some of the ways that he tells stories about some, some key objects out in the night sky. And again, I just think this storytelling aspect is so important, even compared to a John Webb Space Telescope image. Um, an image can give visual impact but I think only a story can really give meaning. And the moments that I've spent looking out on the stars, even with Mark I uh, observing devices, is, thanks Isaac, I'm gonna steal that one. Um, it's where you get that almost indescribable sense of meaning about what our place is in this, in this big scheme of things. And uh, again, that's why I'm, I'm so looking forward to um, a storytelling talk in April, and why I want to really enjoy the post, as COVID recedes into the rearview mirror, getting much more social about how I practice astronomy. Initially, I wanted to be left alone with my devices and work them out and figure out how to do my two-star alignment. And I'm an only child, so that comes very naturally to me. 
but I realize what I'm missing now is the community and the, the sort of body of knowledge that will help impart meaning on, on what it is that we're seeing uh, through that scope. Um, so, but with a few extra gadgets to help us along the way. <laughs> Bring it up. Any other uh, thoughts or observations? If you come to the Cassius meeting, you'll find out how far people just, uh, I'll deep the round of moments. Yeah. 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 I've, I've, seen, I've seen Muhammad set up out there and gotten a small taste of just how far you can go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you need a callback like, for a new equatorial mount if you can't get the uh, fancy computer. That's right, that's right, that's right. If I could give you a little advice, um, uh, Isaac is a member of an organization called Hubbell. And a former member of that organization uh, was uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Burke. Mm -hmm. And Gary Burke spent a lot of time doing astrophotography back in the early days uh, when it was just starting to be possible to get really nice CCD cameras and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he also had a, a wife situation where he had to justify his spending with his wife. <laughs> and. He was at a party once, and his wife was bragging about how skilled he was at doing astrophotography. And she said, and he spends hundreds of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of dollars. And Gary, Gary said, yes, I spend hundreds of dollars. <laughs> he did not say how many hundreds of dollars. <laughs> But from this day forward, he refers to $100 as one astro buck. <laughs> so if you spend a buck. It's like an astronomical yeah. unit, right? Yeah. An astro buck. It's one astro buck. So, so just throwing that out there for you. For, for, the, initi for the initiated. <laughs> we call it the hot bucks. What's 10.5 yeah. 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 astro bucks among friends? Yeah, yeah. it's a hot buck. Yeah. But, but yeah. It's involved. It, it, it has involved. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem with that is when, if you happen to pass away, you have to make sure that your wife knows who the people are that are going to sell your equipment. Right. Because you don't want her to sell it for them. Yeah, astro bucks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I think there's a postscript to that story because he said that um, <clears throat> one day out of the blue, she asked him to go and, and, and observe with her. And, and apparently, um, she, you know, she saw all the equipment and everything, and, and she was very like, oh, that's mm -hmm. nice. You know, <laughs> and didn't, didn't, didn't <clears throat> chastise him at all. He said, but uh, he said the next morning she said, um, you know, I think I'd like to remodel the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Telescopes, as I call them, uh, first came out. The first reaction that people had when they were looking through is like, "Yeah, right. This is just populating this with Google images, right?" Because when you put your eye to a eyepiece that's really just a, another digital screen, um, sort of like uh, in a mirrorless SLR camera, where you're not actually having the light come through the lens, bounce off a mirror, and up into your eyepiece, it's just hitting the sensor and the sensor sending a signal to another screen that your eye gets pressed up against. Um, you know, okay, that's the Orion Nebula, sure, but I could Google it and get that same image, right? Is this thing really gathering light or is it just have a database on a hard drive of, of astro images? And how would we know if Unistellar isn't just pulling one over on us? And they assured us and they showed up, the, you know, and, but it, you know, it's just telling, I think, the value that actually having the light that your people has. 
And I, I don't see them as, as sort of, you know, growing out of optical-based astronomy into digital astro, electronically assisted photography, astronomy. Um, I know for me, uh, as I talked about in my last talk back in May, I actually worked backwards from getting a high magnification uh, six inch telescope to a slightly lower magnification but wider field of view, um, four and a half inch refractor to some of the most exciting viewing sessions I have now is when I put the lawn chair out there with my binoculars and just sort of lean back and snoop around. Um, you know, sometimes that simplicity, the ultimate grab and go, uh, where it just feels very organic, uh, really helps. In fact, one of the things I did do that I think kind of worked with uh, Orion is I actually had them look at the Orion Nebula through the binoculars first before they looked through the scope so that they can sort of, okay, there's the bell, there's the sheath, there's the nebula, I'll, I guess, I'll trust you. And then they saw it in the scope and I think that sort of mechanical, you know, organic analog way of identifying it in the celestial sphere that they were familiar with, and then translating that to the scope really seemed to be more impactful to them. Well, there's also, you know, for those that don't have the privilege that we have of being able to actually see or not very well sighted, ways to share the experience with folks that have slowly worked on myself and try to develop and explain to people. It's like, really, when you're doing astronomy the way we do it, you know, we're focused on just a little patch of our bodies. The light coming into a little patch of our bodies. But even when you're standing there, you're bathed in the light of those objects or whatever you're looking at. Even though you can't see it, it's there. It's part of you. And what I often do is tell these folks, like, just imagine you're standing outside on a warm, sunny day, and the feeling that you have from that, and just translate that to where the moment you're standing here now. Mm. You just need a little lower, feel lower SPF when you're moving in front. Yeah, SPF negative five. You know, the point is basically just, you know, even people who can't see, you know, let you know they're they're part of it, and, and there's ways that. That's beautiful. Another, another thing I think that's kind of important is you know, learning astrophotography is, you know, is a skill and, and learning how to set up your telescope and camera and everything. That's a, that's a skill. But learning how to see is also a skill. Um, you just don't go out and look through a telescope and automatically appreciate everything that the human eye is capable of gathering. For that point, you have to you have to practice. You have to train. You have to learn how to allow your eyes to dark adapt. I'm willing to bet that most people that look through a telescope uh, in your immediate vicinity have probably been staring at a screen for the last ten minutes, or sitting in a car with a light on, and that kind of thing. And they haven't actually trained themselves to slow down to see the tiny little subtle details that your eye can give you. You have to actually slow your heart rate in a, in, in a strange sort of way. And when you, yeah, when you do that, yeah, sketching is a really good way of doing that. When you do that, you see more, and you get that direct experience a lot more directly. I, I find being able to see really faint, very difficult to see things that, you know, are just at the bar barely at the edge of visibility to be really thrilling because it's it's telling me that my the mechanism in my eye is working at its very best. You know? Absolutely, I, I've experienced a bit of the averted seeing benefits where you look away from the object you're trying to target, but I, I know I have a lot of room to grow in that one. Could you elaborate on the relationship between sketching and? Uh, and seeing, I, I've never tried sketching before. So one of the things about sketching, um, especially like if you're looking at Jupiter, the perfect example. You know, you look at it initially, and it's like you guys see the top hands. But if you sit there and you relax and you just look at it, and all of a sudden you start seeing more details pop out, right? When I'm like, um, when I did a sketch of the Orion Nebula, I started seeing more, maybe it's my magic, I don't know. But uh, you I missed see, yourself. <laughs> well, you start seeing more uh, detail pop out because you're relaxed, right? Your, your blood pressure is lowering. 
right? You're, I don't know, it's just, it's like, it's like you're accumulating, just like a camera, it's accumulating things, right? But you're also accumulating, but you're accumulating your impressions. And that's what sketching is. What is my impression of this object? Uh, like, for example, when I look at M5, right, that I drew when I was sketching M5, I don't do every little dinky star, I right, just kind of you know, make a smudge in the middle. But then I, the things that kind of come to my mind, it looks like rose petals coming out, right? I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, another really interesting object is M4. If you look at M4, there's a straight line of stars going right through the cluster. And it's like someone took and divided it up into two kingdoms, right? So in my imagination, I'm thinking like Star Wars, right? Yeah, one's the rebellion side. <laughs> yeah. So this is the kind of stuff that I sketch. It, it's almost like I'm making up stories in my head. Um, who's the guy that did uh, Bernard's, uh, uh, the three volume set? Uh, no, Bernard. 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 One of his best, uh, when he was talking about him, was it in, I think you're talking about in five. He said there, there's a good book by Asimov uh, called um, Nightfall. Uh, Nightfall, yes. And what he said, he goes, I imagine that when the suns went on the other side of their world, it was the first time they've seen night, they found themselves in this globular cluster. He goes, I imagine that that's the globular cluster that they were in. That to me is like you're talking about the storytelling, right? When you connect to something you're looking at, and I'm not saying astrophotography doesn't do that or anything like that, right? Because I do astrophotography and it's fun. But one of the things I always fall back on is when I'm under a dark sky and I'm looking into that eyepiece and I am sketching what I'm seeing, that's when your mind starts, you know, thinking about things. And you start drawing, it's like, little star pattern there before. Like in M13, there's this X right in the middle of the dragon cluster. I remember when I was sketching that I highlighted that X because that was my impression. Right? So it's kind of like it's more if you're talking about organic, it's more of a personal connection to the object than I think when you're just taking a picture. Can I sign you up to do a uh, talk on sketching sometime? <laughs> sure. Yeah, 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 I just want to get back into it because that's probably some of my most enjoyable evenings is sketching. Uh, and anybody, it doesn't cost a lot. That's right. Has anybody else tried sketching before? Very few. Let's, it sounds like a ripe opportunity. Yeah. I might write an article about it. I think that there was optics. Supposed to be doing that. She's supposed to be starting out. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Supposed to be doing that. She's supposed to be starting out. Right. Yeah. 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 Sounds like yeah. Yeah. you're not even got these smarts. Let's do it. Or at least that's the good idea. Sure. 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 You're recording that for later. <laughs> See, baby, if I'm not going to buy the camera gear, I'm going to need a 24 inch knob in order to properly sketch. <laughs> it's called a tool. It's a tool. It's a tool. <laughs> Only 20 Astro units. Yeah. Five bucks. Does it feel like that? There's session scopes right out there, the 20 inch ones, while I use that one. You can take clips out there. Well, he's the guru, and you can sketch right out there. I'd rather do the 18, a little lighter. I'd take an 18. Any other, any other parting thoughts? Well, it strongly, you know, I would observe it helps teach you a little patience to slow down and relax, and because you have to take your time to, you know, to get a benefit out of it. I mean, so much of today's life is about zoom, 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 in a hurry. It's like, yeah. I used to be in the Ocean Cyclone Club back in the 70s, and we would take people down south of Columbus, down into the rural areas and stuff like that, and they got to realize how to slow down. In other words, usually, you know, like if you're driving to Lancaster, you jump on 33 and you go zooming down the road as fast as you can, and you don't see anything. You don't know what's just 
you know, off the side of the road a little bit. And we take them through the little towns and you see the sign where, you know, George Abercrombie lived here or something and he did this and, and the little, you know, the little shops and uh, remains of the old canals and stuff like that. In other words, you slow down and you see that life isn't just, you know, the TV screen in front of you. Yeah. That's yeah, like going down the Greaser Field. One of the things I love about Paul Muskegon River, you see some of the old blocks there. Yeah. Um, on the way down the Greaser Field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something magical about the Muskegon River when it's real calm and it's fall. Mm -hmm. And the sun is setting, you're heading out the Greaser Field, you see the reflection of the the fall leaves. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that uh, bit of poetry to uh, <laughs> 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 Thanks, Thanks for listening to me, guys. Thank you.